Welcome to the line. Sexual harassment is in the news every day right now. Earlier this week, two prominent men in the national media lost their jobs. Matt Lauer was fired from the Today Show and Minnesota Public Radio cut business ties with Garrison Keillor, creator and former host of Prairie Home Companion. And last week, as you know, Charlie Rose was fired from CBS This Morning and his programs were dropped from all PBS stations, including, of course, ours. All of these actions stem from allegations of harassment or inappropriate behavior. And here in New Mexico, we know there are conversations happening among friends and colleagues. If you want to talk with us about sexual harassment in the workplace, go to NewMexicoInFocus.org and get in touch with our producers. Secretary of State Maggie Toulouse Oliver recently announced that her office will offer voluntary sexual harassment training to lobbyists. And State Rep Kelly Fajardo brought attention to sexual harassment of female lobbyists in the Roundhouse. And leaders in the legislature are taking another look at current policies and training on sexual harassment. Now, what policies would lead to real changes in the halls of the Roundhouse? Our line of opinion panelists are ready to talk about this issue. I'm joined at the table this week by Laura sanchez Reve. He's an attorney at Cuddy and McCarthy LLP. Julianne Grimm is here. She's editor of the Santa Fe Reporter. Tom Garrity of the Garrity Group PR is with us. And Andy Lyman with the NM Political Report. Thank you all for joining us. Laura, let me start with you on this, and I want to get a feel from everybody on this first question. This really comes down, Ms. Fajardo uh, picked up on this in her, in her uh, piece as well, the, the culture, the climate culture in the roundhouse. How, is, how does one describe this if, if one does not work there or do business in the roundhouse? They're really, she mentioned an anything goes culture that goes up there. Would you agree with that, that, that that's part of the problem in the roundhouse these days? Wow, way to start with a loaded question. I know, right? <laughs> Seriously. Um, there is uh, a frat house type atmosphere at times. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say that it's everybody, mm -hmm. but I think that um, after very long days and very long nights and inevitably the watering holes start filling up, yep. um, there is somewhat of an anything goes mentality at times. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and and there are just people who engage in that, and there are people who who definitely do not. So I wouldn't say that everybody is that way. But, I, I heard but it there described as this that. almost a summer camp atmosphere. You got people away from home, yes, away from their spouses, away from all that's familiar. There's drinking. There's all kinds of stuff, like you mentioned, yes. happens after hours, and that it ex exacerbates the problem. Ex right it exacerbates it, yeah, yeah, definitely. And and it's not, you know, I've worked in the California legislature, I've worked yeah. in the Arizona legislature, I've worked in New Mexico, I've done some federal work as well. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's unique to New Mexico. Gotcha. I think that that does exist in other places. Mm -hmm. um, I think the big difference in New Mexico, it, I'll just compare it to Arizona. Arizona had even back 18 years ago when I was working in the legislature there had um, uh, almost 50% women mm. elected officials. We do not here. Uh -huh. This is our first um, female governor. Um, I, I do think there was um, a lot of it under the previous administration that occurred and there was just a different kind of mentality once the drinks came out and the cigars came out mm -hmm. that, that isn't necessarily as strong there now. But, mm. um, you know, it, it, it is, there, there is a lot of it and it's not just, it's not just legislators, sure. it's lobbyists That's as right. well. It's, it's everybody. It's, people who are staff. I mean, there is just that kind of culture. Mm -hmm. And it is a tough place, I think, for a woman to be taken seriously. I think there's two places for a woman in many cases. You become, you know, the, the eye candy or you become the, the you know, the hard ass bitch. Sure, sure. You're going to bleep that out, I hope. Yeah. But those are the two Your sort of, well made, that, that's Absolutely. the dichotomy. That's right. Yeah. That's right. You know, Tom, interesting, Ms. Fajardo made a good point in her, her uh, assessment as well that for a female lobbyist, there's really not, there's not a place you can go to now and, and get what feels like a credible ear heard. Do you know what I mean? You're talking, you're talking to people who work for these legislators. And so it may be not be the best person to go to to file a complaint. Are you sensitive of that kind of issue? That, that, that really makes sense to me when I hear that. Yeah, you know, the, uh, the whole uh, climate that we're in now is really bringing to light a lot of different types of stories. Uh, yeah. Senator Lisa Taraco, uh, I was listening to her earlier this week on the Eddie Aragon show, mm -hmm. and she was sharing how she was harassed by a female lobbyist huh. and how she was just totally, you know, out of sorts as a result it was during her first session. She served one uh, four-year term at the, up at the legislature. And I think that, you know, between Representative Fajardo and then uh, Senator Taraco, uh, you know, there is there is a need, you know, for mm -hmm. sexual harassment training. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Will it work? I hope it does. Well, you know, hopefully the conversation alone will help to change the atmosphere, right. uh, you know, for those who, you know, are the bad characters up mm -hmm. in Santa Fe. Exactly right. Julianne, the idea that uh, for a lobbyist, if you, you have bills, you want to move forward. So you're really in a tough spot. If you complain, what happens to your bill? You see what I mean? It's a very difficult position for women to be in as a lobbyist. 
And Ms. Toulouse Oliver, as I mentioned, has come out with some ideas to, for some training. What would you like to see as far as training goes? What is that, when you hear training, what does that mean to you? I think that's a tough one. Yeah. You know, it's something that becomes sort of a, a rallying cry whenever we have a, like a public conflict. You right. know, what we're telling inappropriate jokes, we are um, talking to each other in a manner that makes, you know, some people feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And how do you sort of educate about that? How do you um, have a serious conversation about that? You know, I was in a, a unnamed newsroom in a previous uh, training like that. And as we all walked out of the door after talking about sexual harassment for an hour, mm. one guy slapped another guy on the rear end and said, good game. Wow. And we all walked down the hallway kind of chuckling. But that seems to be sort of the way that those trainings are perceived. It's like sexual harassment panda on South Park. And so I don't know how um, the Secretary of State is going to approach that. But she is a, a serious and thoughtful and creative person. And mm -hmm. I hope that the resources that she's consulting and the you know um, style that she adopts to do that training really, as Tom said, works, You know, mm -hmm. has an effect. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reminded, though, too, in the scenario of the the ethics commission and oh. ethics training and ethics investigations that have gone on and it's sort of the same thing to me that um, if this doesn't strike you at your core as something that's really bad behavior right. and you're an adult you're maybe a 60 year old man you know or is someone really going to teach this out of you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's a that's fair a, question yeah. yeah absolutely we can't get out of this conversation Andy without talking about Senator Michael Padilla who's in the news as well, and uh, he running for lieutenant governor. We have Michelle Lujan Grisham, who was running for governor, who has asked him to drop out because of allegations from 2000, uh, from about 10 years ago when he was here in Albuquerque. This is a tough one to sort of parse out when you think about it, because one side might say, well, you know what, that was quite a long time ago. Another side might say, you know what, there's a pattern here that just because it was this quiet period doesn't mean it had stopped. It's a tough one. How do, we, how do we figure out where the line is on who gets to move forward with their life if one of these things come to light versus everything's just over at that point? I mean, I guess what struck me is that it was a long time ago, but not that it was a long time ago, that it's been out there this whole time. Right. There's sort of this outrage now that he was elected to leadership, that he's running for lieutenant governor, but it's really been out there. It's been, he's been, this has come up every time that he's run for an election. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that... Uh, Unfortunately, what we'll probably see is is a lot of partisan uh, accusations. You're not going to see people from within their own party um, bringing to light some of these things, um, and so I think that unfortunately becomes a partisan issue. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the answer ultimately is. Mm -hmm. Besides, the pick up on that. Uh, Andy makes a good point about the, a partisan <laughs> issue. We have a, a legislative term uh, a session coming up. This is clearly going to be part of the conversation. Where do you see this sort of going? Because we now have a figurehead, so to speak, to to sort of you know, pin this on with, with Mr. Padilla. Where, where do you see this going? Um, you, you know, I think there's, there's multiple sides to this. I don't think it's black and white. And I don't think it's a partisan issue. I really hope that it doesn't become a partisan issue because it's such a much more important issue. And it's, it's all parties, all ages, right. all races. It's That's really, right. you know, it, it's everywhere. Um, I think what's different here is that you have some evidence of, of a settlement having occurred yep. um, due to actions. And, and, you know, I do employment discrimination issues at my work as well. Um, sometimes a settlement is not that there was actual, um, uh, you know, evidence that something occurred. A settlement can often indicate that the cost of litigation was far, far exceeded mm -hmm. what uh, potential demand was. And so you could get out of it much easier. And right. it's a money, uh, dollar and cents issues. Sure. So that is a possibility. Um, I do think it has been around for a long time and it has come up in his races. Mm -hmm. I personally have interacted with him a lot and have never seen anything like that from him. And like I said, it, there are people out there that you see it regularly with. Um, the one thing I will say about Michelle, you know, having come out, she was asked specifically about this because we're in a climate now where a lot of, a lot of thought leaders and, and you know, leaders in general politicians are being asked about this. And as somebody who's a member of Congress and dealing with issues federally and who's running for governor, I think it was appropriate that the AP asked her specifically about this. Mm -hmm. And she had a statement, I think, that was consistent with what she's said before in past instances. I mean, mm -hmm. let's not forget she was a commissioner in Bernalillo County and she was, um, there at the time when Michael Weiner, our own Weiner, was being, you know, right. accused of That's some right. impropriety, and she took a very firm position then. So I don't think that her statement is in any way different from what um, what she stood for all along. 
And so I think in that sense, it's, it's, you know, it's not surprising. But again, I think what people are surprised about is that she didn't sort of come out sooner with something like this. Well, she yeah, was sure. asked at that point right. about it. And I think she, she gave an appropriate statement. Right. Um, what happens after this, I think, is up to um, Senator Padilla, whether he remains in that race. Right. But I think it will probably be a cloud during this next 30 day session. Mm -hmm. And I, I hope that it's not, uh, that it's addressed. I, I'm happy that Maggie's, uh, the Secretary of State is working on something. Mm -hmm. I'd actually kind of like to see it mandatory rather than voluntary. Right. And have people have to go through some of this. Uh, I, I gotta think that's coming, that mandatory bit. Tell me, got just about a minute and a half left on this. Your, your sense on Mr. Padilla, you know, you know, we don't know if he's gonna stay in, drop out, who knows, that's probably irrelevant at this point, but the idea that this, <coughs> the, this legislature is gonna have to deal with this now. Oh, absolutely. Right. And, you know, it's, uh, I, I think it's unfortunate because, you know, I think the claims are of convenience. Uh, you know, his, uh, he was voted. Uh, he's won election, I believe, twice. Right. And these were not new issues at the time. Uh, he was elected into Senate leadership by his peers, uh, very well aware of the issues at the time. And now that there's a national climate that's bringing, you know, very important attention to an issue like this, mm -hmm. uh, it all of a sudden becomes convenient to say, oh, well, hey, hold on, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think that that's the unfortunate part because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, I don't know the circumstances, uh, you know, around his situation, but, you know, it appears that, uh, you know, he's, you know, his vote, you know, his uh, electorate and his peers don't view it as an issue. And all of a sudden uh, it is. There's an echo there of Alabama and what we got going on there with Mr. Moore. You know, constituents might see it differently than the rest of us, that kind well, of thing. I mean, I there's, think there's, you know, there's, there's some similarity, two, but, yeah. but there's some very big differences mm -hmm. between what, what, uh, what Alabama's candidate for Senate, right. Moore, uh, has, has been accused of mm -hmm. and what we're talking about here with Senator Padilla. So, right. I mean, uh, not to say one is, one is okay, but there's a big difference in terms of the, what the allegations are. <laughs> and, and again, there's... I don't think that you can always look at a settlement as an evidence of guilt. A settlement often means that the employer, which would have been in the city in this, in this case, mm -hmm. thought that it was easier to get out of this litigation by paying out some amount rather than pay attorneys to fight this out in court. Sure. Absolutely. We'll see where this goes now. In just a moment, this week's line panelists react to a debate over ranked choice voting in Santa Fe.